Good morning and welcome to King's Church Frodham, where we are encountering Jesus together. A big welcome if you are joining us online this morning. It's a great opportunity when illness or distance keeps you away, but there's nothing like being in the building uh, with the church family. Um, but if you are online, please like us, comment, interact with us. If you are in the building, uh, fire escapes are to my right and to the back. Um, children are a big part of us here. So they're welcome to join us at the front. And it's great to have our students back as well from university. Welcome back. <laughs> um, a couple of notices. Next week, Christmas Day service starts at 10 a.m. So it is slightly earlier. But please do come and join us for the biggest celebration of the year. Um, what else? Is that it? I think that's it, actually. Christmas lunch afterwards. Can you still book? Yeah, so if you do want to join us for Christmas lunch after the service next week, please do speak to Tabitha because she is buying and cooking the food. Um, I will open in prayer and then hand over to our worship band. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Thank you for bringing us here safely this morning. I thank you that the weather is actually warming up. Um, and I just praise you, Lord. Uh, we're just here for you. And we commit this morning to you. Thank you for meeting us exactly where we are. Amen. Turn up this. Let's um, prepare our hearts for the message. Today is the week of joy as we approach Christmas next week. So let's, let's sing. Hark the herald angels sing. And just consider Christmas and the story that's so, so important to us. by the angel and told that she would have a, a son and then Joseph was told to name him Jesus. Little did they know that the name Jesus would have such power and authority throughout the ages and even now. So let's sing now what a beautiful name it is because when Jesus is born 
Jesus becomes our savior. You know, he, his name has so much power and authority. So let's sing.
it's almost Christmas. And the scary thing about that is that hot on the tails of Christmas is New Year. I was chatting to people today and they're going, don't talk about New Year. That's, we've got to get through this next week. The problem is, and here's a secret, ministers take the Sunday of after Christmas off to recover from Christmas. But this year that can't happen because New Year's Day is a Sunday. So we thought we'd do something different here. We thought, if people want to gather, what do we want to gather for? Now, we want to gather because we want to worship the Lord and we want to see our friends. But food, faith, friends, and food is a very important thing. So we're going to have a continental breakfast service. So we're not going to sit like this and then have breakfast. We're going to sit around tables and have breakfast. right? And you know who's making that breakfast? I have no idea either. <laughs> so we need to know more or less ideas of numbers. And more or less, can you bring something? And if you can chat to Isabel or myself, that would be fantastic. Right? I'll make scones. I'll get up early or I'll stay up late or something like that and make scones. But the service itself, we want to be a celebration of what God has done and what God is going to do. And so in that service, we're going to give a great deal of service over to you to celebrate Maybe to share testimony or to share something that's on your heart. It, keep it short, right, so that other people can be there. But just an opportunity for us to acknowledge that God is a God of the impossible. He's done the impossible in the last year, and we want Him to do far more than the impossible in the year to come. So um, that's the community slot for this week. And uh, I'm hoping to see you on Christmas. Christmas is that really special occasion where people will come to church if you drag them kicking and screaming, particularly young people. Wouldn't it be amazing if this year many, many people came to know the Lord as their Savior at Christmas when He's supposed to be coming into the world? Right, I'm going to hand over to our... Who's praying today? Bill? But first to Richard and Isabel who are going to light our candle. You'll see we've got one candle that's a slightly different color. Don't judge us. The one broke. We haven't done this for a long time, you know. <laughs> only, only when we were young with kids, you know, <laughs> for our practice. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, the fourth candle, the fourth Advent candle, the theme is, is love. And um, the Bible tells a lot about love, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to read part of it now. What is love? If I could speak in any language in heaven or on earth, but didn't love others, I would only be making meaningless noise like a loud gong or a clashing symbol. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I knew all the mysteries of the future, and knew everything about everything, but didn't love others, what good would I be? And if I had the gift of faith, so I could speak to a mountain, make it move, without love, I would be no good to anybody. If I gave everything I have to the poor, and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would be of no value whatsoever. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable and keeps no record of when it has been wronged. It is never glad about injustice, but it rejoices whenever the truth wins out. 
Love never gives up, never loves, uh, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Love will last forever, but prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will all disappear. There are three things that will endure, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you that you are love. That as we walk through this life, we can experience your love in so many ways. It's, it endures forever. We know it's something we can always count on, no matter what's going on around us. You are constant. You are our companion, our guide, our friend, our protector. And most of all, you surround us with your love. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can come this morning knowing that you receive us and love to bless us with your presence. It is so good to come and give glory to our Saviour Jesus this day. But Father, as always, we consider the world around us and the many problem areas that continue to plague us, the continued war in Ukraine and other parts of the world. The many people, including many children, suffering from AIDS, malaria, and so many other diseases throughout Africa, the Middle East, and beyond. As your children, we come with confidence to raise before you these matters that so greatly affect the world in which we live. We once again cry out to our God for your intervention to bring peace where so many are suffering from the terrible bombings in many cities in Ukraine to bring aid to those suffering from terrible diseases in so many parts of the world, and to bring the knowledge of salvation to those who are living with little or no hope in the world. At this Christmas time, we think of the many homeless people sleeping on the streets of our cities throughout the land. Already we are experiencing one of the coldest winters for many years, and we shudder to think of the hardships these people are suffering. Thank you, Father, for the many charitable organisations that seek to bring some aid to these unfortunate souls. Bring comfort to these people, we pray. But, Father, we also seek your face this morning for us as a people, as individuals, and as a church. We are encouraged at the work we see you doing here in Frodsham. You are building your church in accordance with your promise, and we rejoice at what we see. It is but a small beginning, and we are excited to anticipate the wonders that you will perform amongst us even this day. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Oh, I feel like one of those singers, you know. It's not sitting on my head properly, but hey ho, let's go. Yeah, but it doesn't fit. Oh well, then. I feel like I've got an Alice band on. Um, so, this morning, over the last three weeks, and as I've studied for uh, this sermon, I want to share what I've found out. There was probably no donkey. No stable, no innkeeper, Jesus wasn't silent, no suggestions of animals in the place Jesus was born, the angels didn't sing, no mention of the king's riding camels, oh and by the way the wise men didn't visit Jesus um, until he was about one or two years old and they visited him at a house, Christmas ruined. No, not at all, because there's so much in the story, the lead up to that first Christmas that I want to look at through the eyes of a young teenage girl who lived in a notoriously wicked town. 
As it was custom, when she reached puberty, she was found a husband and was engaged or betrothed to him for about a year before they were married. And during this time, she would learn from her mother how to be a good wife and how to be a good mother. I think you'll have guessed I'm talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was around 13 years of age. It says between 12 and 14, so we'll go for 13. And she came from an unimportant and a notoriously wicked town called Nazareth in the hills of Galilee. She came from a poor but honourable family. Her family were descendants of Israel's greatest king, David. She'd been carefully trained in the scriptures and knew great portions of them by heart. She knew that God had promised to send the Messiah, one who would rescue her people Israel and be their king. For 400 years, God had been silent. No new scripture was written. No prophets had spoken. Every Jewish girl prayed to be the mother of this Messiah. Mary loved God and wanted to serve him with all of her heart. But she was just a poor girl in an insignificant town from a humble family with no great expectations that her life was going to be any different from her mother's or from that of the other women in her town. We, didn't, we don't read anything about Mary's mother and father in the Bible. I wonder why there's no mention of the grandparents of Jesus. Something to ponder over. Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Interestingly, if you Google how old was Joseph, some sites say he was 90. But I think he was a lot younger than that. We know that he was a carpenter, hard-working and responsible. He was a kind man, and the more Mary knew him, the more she appreciated his sensitivity and his gentleness towards her. Life would be good with Joseph. She was so glad that her parents had made such a good match for her. The Apostle Luke is the only apostle that covers the birth of Christ in so much detail. And we need to remind ourselves that Luke was a doctor. He says in verse 3 of Luke 1 that he has carefully investigated everything from the beginning. Thorough investigation by interviewing many people, Mary being one of them. For him to be the one apostle that focuses on the virgin birth and confirm to us through his writing that he truly believed it, how clever is God to choose a doctor to tell us about this? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you're not got a doctor now, you're a mister. <laughs> right, Luke 1, 26 to 37. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. Mary's purity and her innocence are clearly revealed in her words in verse 34. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am still a virgin. This is one of the strongest evidence of Mary's virginity. 
Because if she weren't a virgin, she would be terrified to lie to an angel, don't you think? Imagine saying to the angel, I'm a virgin, when she knew she wasn't really. And this, from her own mouth, comes the evidence. I'm a virgin, I'm not married, I've not had any sexual relationships. So how can this be? Compare this with the reaction of Sarah in Genesis 18, verses 9 to 15. She overheard the conversation with the Lord and Abraham, where Abraham was told that Sarah would have a son a year later. They were both very old, and she was past the age of childbearing. But verse 12 tells us, Sarah laughed to herself. And she also lied to the Lord and said she hadn't laughed. The Lord asked the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? And as we know, the Lord was true to his word, and she had Isaac. Or what about the reaction of Zechariah in Luke 1, verses 5 to 23, when he was told by the angel Gabriel that Elizabeth would have a son in her old age, and he was to be called John. And another point I'll pick up on later is that in Luke 1, verse 16, John would be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. Zachariah doubted and said, how can I be sure of this? And the result being that Zachariah could not speak until John was born. Mary didn't laugh in dis- disbelief or doubt it. What she was asking for was the how. The angel's answer in verses 35 to 37 had to stretch her faith because it was certainly something she could not have understood. It didn't matter if she could understand it. She believed that God was able to do what he said he would do, and that was enough. We get great insight into Mary's heart and character from her response to this revelation. We looked at verse 38. If you ever want to know exactly what Mary, the mother of Jesus, was, was, this verse will tell you. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Now I understand that the word servant, there are several words for this used in the Bible. And the one Mary uses is the lowest form of servanthood. This is a bond slave, a dual. She says, I am the Lord's slave. Let it be to me as you have said. What do we see here about our attitude? Humility? Total submission to the will of God. Now listen, this didn't just happen at the moment when all of a sudden the angel comes and tells her this. This was the pattern of her life. This was a young teenager that she could have this kind of relationship with God. What a remarkable young girl she was. She was willing to serve God at any cost, and cost there would be. There was a strong possibility that the revelation of her being pregnant could result in her being stoned to death. Most certainly divorced and shunned by everyone, leaving her to defend for herself out on the street. She wondered how she could explain anything so strange to her mother, to Joseph. Would they believe her? If you recall, Mary had already been told by the angel that her cousin was pregnant and gave even more detail that she was in her sixth month. And we continue to be told from verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed Are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfil his promises to her. So the next we read is that Mary went to visit her cousin Elizabeth. In fact, it says she hurried The journey Mary was was taking was probably around 80 miles, and it would take several days. 
Did you ever wonder why Mary went? Was it because she was being sent away so people wouldn't talk about her? Or was it God sending her to be taught about pregnancy and childbirth? There's a lot in the verse we have read, but it must have been a shock. Elizabeth knew about the baby without Mary telling her. God used Elizabeth to confirm to Mary that she would be the mother of the Son of God. Now, something we need to learn, God always tells us first and then gets somebody else to confirm. God also commended her faith. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord said to her will be accomplished. The angel had said, nothing is impossible with God. And she had simply believed what the angel said. She simply believed that what God said he would do, he could do. And that's a perfect definition of faith. That's as simple as we need to be for faith. This is a young teenager who simply believed God and wanted to serve him with all her life. Is there anything you have stopped believing God for? What is it that you have not seen answered and so you've given up? What situation seems so impossible that you may have decided not to pray for it anymore. Nothing could have seemed more impossible than Gabriel's message. But Mary simply believed God, submitted to his will, and the baby was already growing in her womb. There are some interesting side issues here. If you ever wanted evidence for the fact that an embryo is not a thing and a piece of tissue, but a real person, you have it here. The baby leaped in his mother's womb for joy. Elizabeth already referred to the child that Mary was carrying. She said, the mother of my Lord should come to me. You have a very great evidence right in this passage. Also note that Elizabeth and therefore the baby she was carrying were filled with the Holy Spirit, just as Gabriel had said. Now Mary's heart responds... And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months, and then returned home. Her mouth is filled with a hymn of praise. It's both poetry and prophecy, and it reveals some very important things to us. In the first place, it reveals the depths of Mary's spiritual understanding. I don't think there are a lot of young teenagers around who could have composed something like this. It reveals a great knowledge of God's word because every single phrase is taken from one of the Psalms. She didn't go looking up anything. She just knew it, and it poured out of her. It reveals she also knew God's character. And the only way you can know God's character is to be saturated with God's word. This young woman did not have 15 translations of the Bible. Every Jewish child was taught God's word as soon as he or she was able to speak, and they memorized it. It was rote memory, and Mary knew God's word. There's something very important here, because of all the wrong ideas that have been perpetuated about Mary that we see revealed. Mary knew something about herself. What was it? It's in verse 47. You see, she said, My spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. Why would Mary need a saviour? Because she was just like us. She was born from Adam. She was a sinner with a sin nature. And each of us are the same. 
Mary knew she was a sinner and needed a saviour so that her sins could be forgiven. It's most unfortunate that in the effort to exalt Mary beyond what scripture has done, and remember, scripture calls her blessed among women, that in an effort to exalt her, she's been declared sinless. Mary would be the first to deny this. She knew she needed a saviour, and now God was giving her the unique privilege of being the means by which this saviour, her own son, would come into the world. In verse 56, it says, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Maybe she stayed until John was born. It would seem strange for her to stay and then leave just before Elizabeth came to term. But possibly she stayed and watched as Elizabeth gave birth. Maybe God had given her this opportunity to have real life lessons to prepare her for what was to come. And then she went back to Nazareth. I wonder what Mary's parents thought when Mary went away. Maybe she didn't travel alone. Maybe her mother went with her and witnessed all that was said. But if that didn't happen, I wonder how Mary managed the conversation when she went home to tell them that she was three months pregnant and still a virgin. Would you have believed her if that were your daughter? And there was still Joseph to tell. Would he believe her? A betrothal in that day was much more binding than an engagement is today. In fact, they considered them husband and wife already. The only thing was they didn't live together. And they certainly didn't have sexual relations before they were married. A betrothal could only be broken by a divorce. Getting back to Mary telling Joseph, we know he was a righteous man and he didn't want to expose Mary to public disgrace, but he had in mind to divorce her quietly. I guess there would also be some disgrace to him as well. Now what does that tell us? He didn't believe her. Do you think that? He didn't believe her. He was shocked because Mary had seemed to be so pure and so faithful. He must have been terribly hurt. You can only assume that. You can imagine what that must have been to him. He knew that he couldn't marry her now. The law said that she should be publicly judged and the penalty was to be stoned to death, which wasn't always enforced. But in Deuteronomy it says, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. If a man happens to meet in a town a virgin pledged to be married and he sleeps with her, you shall take both of them to the gate of that town and stone them to death. The young woman, because she was in a town and did not scream for help, and the man, because he violated another man's wife. You must purge the evil from among you. Joseph couldn't do that to Mary. He still cared for her. He would arrange to sign the papers for divorce privately. And he went to bed that night with a very heavy heart. But imagine what Mary was feeling, knowing that the man that she was supposed to marry did not believe her. Mary knew what it was like to be accused of something she did not do and to have her character questioned. Put yourself in her place. This would be one of the most hurting things that a woman could feel. But then look at Matthew 1, 20 to 23. But after he continued this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus had took time to reflect and pray about what had happened. What a good job he did. What a wonderful relief must have been to know that Mary's fantastic story was really true. 
An angel of the Lord had spoken to him in a dream. Actually, the only way God communicates with Joseph through the whole thing is through dreams. It's interesting. The child conceived in her virgin womb was by the Holy Spirit, and he was to be called Jesus. Now, Jesus, the word means the Lord saves. In that little word, we see who he is and what he would do. He's the Lord, and he would save. He would save his people from their sins. And then he's also Emmanuel, God with us, the one the scriptures have prophesied for centuries. We see something about Joseph's character in the next verse. This is the way he acted any time we see him mentioned. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He obeyed immediately, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. He obeyed the next day. He took Mary home with his wife under his protection to wait for the birth of her child. Both of these godly people sacrificed the right to consummate their marriage until after a child was born. Then we're told they lived a normal married life. You'll notice he said he did not have union with her until she gave birth to a son, which would mean that after she gave birth to Jesus, they had a normal life. You see, it's a wrong emphasis that Mary was a perpetual virgin. God instituted marriage, God blessed marriage, and God honours marriage. She's three months pregnant, at least, and they've just been married. I wonder what the next six months were like. Did those around her judge her? Did she live under this shadow for the rest of her life? Mary knew the suffering of being accused and convicted of the worst thing that a virtuous woman could be accused of. Mary was able to endure rumours about her reputation because she knew the charges were not true. Being God's servant's not always a bed of roses, but there is no better calling in life, even though it means the loss of things that we consider very precious. In this case, it was her good name. In Luke 2, we read, In those days Caesar Augusta issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place. Um, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Mary was very near the end of her pregnancy when the news came to Nazareth that Caesar had decreed that everyone had to go to the town their family came from to be enrolled for tax purposes. Both Joseph and Mary had to go because both of them were descendants from King David and they had to go to Bethlehem, David's city. It was a journey of about 90 miles and even though we always see her on a donkey, we have no way of knowing if that was really true. Either she had to go by foot or she did ride a donkey. And it was at least three to four days journey. I wonder if she remembered the prophecy, but you Bethlehem, through you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. The Messiah, who would come, would be born in Bethlehem. Just in a, um, an observation, Mary embarks on two journeys, one when Jesus has been conceived and one when Jesus is to be born. What journey is Jesus taking you on? Back to the story. When they arrived in the town, it would be packed with other people who had come for the same purpose. Mary would have been exhausted and in the first stages of labour and there was no comfortable place to stay. I wonder if she was afraid. 
Here, this very young girl first, facing her first birth with no mother, no friends around. Finally, Joseph found a cave where animals were kept and there on a bed of straw, with no one but Joseph to help, Mary gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in strips of cloth and laid him in an animal feeding trough filled with clean straw. What would she have been thinking in that humble place? God's son has been born in the equivalent of today what we would call a stable or a shipping. There was no family there to share their joy. The birth of the son was something that would be celebrated in a big way. But look what God does. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they'd been told. But God and the whole of heaven were celebrating the birth of his son. He sent these humble shepherds to rejoice with Mary and Joseph. What must she have thought? Well, of course, all the things the angel had told her were starting to come true. And God continues to confirm his promise. Why these shepherds? These humble shepherds were not watching over any old sheep. They were looking after the perfect lambs that were used in sacrifice at the temple. They would be perfect without blemish. That was Jesus, the perfect lamb, sinless, sacrificed for our sins. These shepherds were protecting their sheep. Jesus protects us. These men were not important, not kings or rulers, not rich. Jesus came for everyone, rich, poor, high, low, well, sick. So we see that there was a great deal of significance to all of this. So when the shepherds arrived telling Mary and Joseph that an angel had appeared to them, she sure wouldn't be shocked. After all, the same thing had happened to her. We look at verse 19, we get insight into a reflective nature. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. This is a very thoughtful, deeply reflective spiritual woman. Today we would call her a girl. What a special person she was. We can see why God had chosen her. I wonder when she pondered things at this stage, cradling her newborn son in her arms, not just a son, but God's son, was she overwhelmed with the responsibility? Did she think about what was going to happen as Jesus grew up? Did she have any idea what lay ahead for them? Maybe she did, or maybe she didn't. But I know she had an amazing faith and trust in God. What God's shown me from the study that I've done is, God will tell me before he tells anyone else, but will confirm through someone I trust. The impossible is possible for God. If Mary recognizes she needs a savior, then everybody does. 
When Jesus enters into our lives, he takes us on a journey. Jesus continues to remind us of his promises. We just need a willing heart. It's not about ability. It's not about age, qualification, or experience. What we do for God can make life-changing events happen that no, not only impact the now, but can impact eternity. God made that star millions of years before to shine at that exact time. As we think of God coming down from, earth, uh, from heaven as a tiny baby, putting all his trust in two people so that we could have an eternal life with him. That is true love. like to stand. Thank you, Rainy, for that. I think sometimes we, we over-romanticize Christmas and think about all of the trees and the reindeer and those types of things, but the real reason for Christmas is it's obvious and in front of us, and um, we're going to glorify, we're going to sing, shout to the Lord, because he deserves that, you know. He came to earth to die for our sins. Next weekend, we, we celebrate his birth. And yes, it's lovely to have the Christmas season, but let's, let's remember the real reason for him coming.
Thanks, Rainey. Um, it never fails to amaze me how you can read a familiar story, one that you hear every single year, and still learn things from it. And that just, it's a reminder that the Bible is the living word, and God speaks to us uh, constantly and teaches us new things. So thank you. If you do need prayer, um, as we approach our final week of uh, Advent and preparing ourselves for Jesus' birthday, prayer is available to my left. 
Um, otherwise, there's tea, coffee, um, and a chance to pay your tithes and offerings out in the foyer. Uh, so let's end with the uh, grace. We normally join hands, so if you would like to, join hands, and we'll say the grace together. <laughs>